Yo, check, check, check. How we doing? We all right? Hopefully, hopefully we're doing all right. Um, hopefully the video is not going to drop too many frames. I see it's being slow here. So what's up, y'all? Hope everybody's having a good night. Let me know if the audio is all right. I'm on my brand new laptop here, so I hope it works out okay. Let me see if I can. Yeah, hopefully we're okay. Um, so if we get cut off, if something um, drops down, then I'll try to fix it on the fly here. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can fix the video. What's up, everybody? Hope everybody's doing, having a good night. Tonight, we're covering um, Houdini. We're doing a little something different tonight. Shouts out to everybody who's here. We're covering um, Houdini. So, yeah, it looks like I'm dropping some frames. So, hopefully this will work out. If you guys, let me know if... Okay, I might need to change the video. I might need to change the uh, video quality here. So, give me a second. Uh, let me see here. Let me see. Uh, Jethro says, yeah, I'm dropping some frames. I'm trying to work this all out because I got this super fancy new computer. So if we drop anything, then I'll just try to fix it on the fly or we might have to restart. But let's we'll just keep going for now. Just let me know in the chat if everything's good or if I cut out or anything. Um, so, okay, so tonight we're covering Houdini. And this is a little bit different. This is the man who walked through walls. Okay. So audio is fine. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So this is a little bit different for us be, um, tonight because usually we cover um, literary analysis and we talk about form and content. But this one is going to be, this one's going to be a little different because it's a straight up biography. We haven't, I, have we done any of those? We've done maybe a couple. This is our like 104th analysis. So um, I'd have to go back and look and see if we've done another, any other straight uh, biography. Of course, we did Alistair Crowley, and that kind of ties into tonight a little bit. Uh, we did Al Crowley back in the summertime. So that was a two-parter. If you haven't seen those, um, please go back and watch those uh, because they, I think they were okay. They did pretty well. Um, so this one's a little bit different. Good. Settles down with less movement. So I'll, I'll try to stop spastically moving around. So again, tonight we are covering... Uh, Houdini, the man who walked through walls. This is an interesting biography. I picked this up. You can tell I picked this up for cheap. I had to tape the, the covers back together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I bought this for four bucks at a bookstore down south and thought it would be good because it's written by this guy, uh, William Lindsey Gresham, who wrote Nightmare Alley. And of course, everybody's seen JD's Nightmare Alley analysis, um, the analysis of the uh Bradley Cooper film that came out. And of course we've done um, the director of that film. We did, we did our own analysis over on Jerry's channel. Shouts out to exposing powerful eyes. Um, little Ewok, Jerry. Uh, so this one kind of ties into that uh, to, to nightmare alley. And of course to Al Crowley because Houdini lived around, you know, the same time he was a contemporary of, of Al Crowley. And so I thought this would be kind of kind of an interesting one because it's a little bit different than the other streams that we've done. And because Houdini continues to be a pretty fascinating figure and relevant. And we're going to talk about why he's why he's relevant now, why he continues to be relevant, and why the the author makes uh, clear to quote Houdini in the fact that he was one of these celebrities who railed against uh, against uh, irrelevance through a phrase say, um, saying uh, the specter of oblivion, right? He was he was terrified of the specter of oblivion. And of course, Houdini is one of the first celebs. So of course, in our, in our you know, great we set um, post, post, post modern culture, especially in American culture and the obsession with celebs, I think it's interesting just to go back to one of the first celebs and of course, the first celeb of the modern the modern era the, and of modernity, probably of essentially the um, the modernist movement, especially in America, Houdini represents a lot of those things, and we're going to see what that entails and how he was able to rise to this um, this this uh, celeb, this internet to be this international celeb. Of course, that was through pretty tight control over his own uh, legend, 
and over his own, everything that he did was controlled. Um, and uh, Corey says Laurel Canyon freak. Yes, so we are going to actually talk about Laurel Canyon as part of the stream, especially later on in the stream, because um, a lot of people, of course, have written about Harry Houdini, but I, I would trust one person really in his in terms of his insights into Houdini over all of them, and that would be, of course, our our guy. Uh, McGowan, Dave McGowan, who writes about Houdini in uh, Weird, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, um, his great book about Laurel Canyon. And he will give us some, some insights into Houdini's death, because, of course, Houdini's death itself, you know, everybody kind of knows about Houdini now and and in terms of his death and the, the punch in the stomach and all that. But remember that for a long time, even in the Tony Curtis movie, for most of the 20th century, people thought that he died doing one of his stunts. That's sort of true. As with a lot of these things, we're going to find that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle of all of this, not in terms of like the median way, but in terms of it's hard to tell uh, what Houdini was really up to because that was part of his allure and that was also part of what he did for a living. I mean, he was naturally, of course, he was an illusionist, a trickster, an escape artist, and um he made his he made his way later on in his life in sort of his latter career uh, debunking um, spiritualists and what he saw as um, people taking advantage of people and doing fake seances. Did you know that Houdini even um, tried to get a law passed and gave con congressional testimony? You may not have known that. You may you may have. But we're going to talk about um, my view, for what it's worth, of uh, what probably caused. Houdini's death um, and the reasons for it because uh, as with this dude, a lot of what this dude does, you know, nothing is like what it seems and we're going to just basically go into the biography of Houdini. Now in terms of his um, his spying career and there was a book published a few years ago which we're going to discuss I, didn't, I couldn't get that book in time and um, and I thought it would be probably better to actually read just a straight biography of of this dude and see if there was anything about espionage and all of the things that are touched on in the other book I know are sort of hinted at in this book in terms of the straight accepted facts so we're going to see um, we're going to look into some of the excerpts from the other book though and we're going to see if there's any truth or any evidence for his espionage so or so-called espionage career. Now, again, that that is, it's hard to determine what the truth of this is, except for circumstantial evidence. And of course, the diary of this guy, um, who we we've actually the guy whose diary, um, William Melville, who writes about um, Houdini and says that he was his handler. Uh, that dude did later go on to be to found MI five, and is so is is. So it is in some books they say is the reason that M like in the Bond movies, right? M is uh, M because of Melville. Of course it could be the ministry itself or whatever, but we're going to look at that. Um, and we're going to see if there's any truth to that, but we've seen this guy before because he popped up uh, when talking about Crowley and his own um, espionage. So let's go ahead and get started. And, um, I'm glad to see everybody tonight. Happy New Year. If you want to support me, please um, think about hitting that subscribe button. If you're watching this and you haven't subscribed, you can also share the stream. And of course, I would really appreciate it if you could uh, possibly support me by clicking those those links in the chat or in the on the about page of my YouTube page um, or just clicking that down button and seeing some of those links and supporting me. I really appreciate it. Gotten a bunch of um, new books, new uh, literary inventory, I guess you could say. So we're going to be doing a lot of that coming up. We recently did um, Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Please go back and check out my road um, analysis. I thought it was pretty good. It's doing all right, but we've done a lot of Cormac McCarthy, and um, those always seem to do well um, because we get a lot out of out of McCarthy. But if you like those, please go back and give them a watch or a rewatch. Next up, we're probably going to be doing Herman Hesse's, uh Steppenwolf, which I'm tearing through right now. Um, I've also got Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory, and we'll be doing the Prestige film. There's a book for the Prestige. It's based off a book 
I might need to take my sweater off here in a minute because it's getting kind of kind of hot in here. You can see that. So uh, we'll be um, we'll be going into the Prestige, uh, the the film and the book. And what else have I got on the way? I've got uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the novelization by Tarantino, and we'll be doing the film. Of course, that's the sponsor stream. We'll also be doing, I got Richard Hughes' High Wind in Jamaica on the way. Bunch of books on the way. Uh, I can't even remember the whole stack of books, but that's also uh, thanks to you guys for supporting me and, and allowing me to, through your, genero- through your generosity, to be able to afford that new uh, stack of books. So please continue to do that um, if you can. And if you, if you would, appreciate you out there. Also, uh, if you want to sponsor a stream, then you can click the links, uh, write me an email, madmaximalism2xs at gmail.com, and um, give me a list of stuff to cover, and I will look into that. All right, so, so yeah, so this is the book we're covering. I got a bunch of this whole stack of stuff right here to cover afterwards. So a couple of things about Houdini. Um, let's start with the beginning here. Um, at this in this prologue, it talks about how it's pretty interesting because it sort of gives the thesis for all of Houdini's activities in his life. Why was he this guy, right? What drove him? What what made him do all this stuff? And what allowed him to sort of rise into international fame? And what was it that people that what was it that people like identified with, especially in the era of you know, late Victorian, late Victorian, the late Victorian world sort of leading up to uh, modernity. This is in the um, sort of height of the Industrial Revolution, pre World War One. What was it that allowed him to soar from sort of just a, a penny act to the Nickelodeons to then vaudeville and then later on to international fame and tours all over the place, um, all the way to film star? And then he went on a circuit. He was a lecturer, author. Houdini died uh, pretty wealthy. He left, uh, I think, $500,000 to Bess Houdini, his his widow. $500,000 in 1926, right? Which is a considerable amount of money. He also, did you know that Houdini himself owned probably the largest collection of books on um, magic, magic escapism and, and all things like that. This is different, though. We need to differentiate this from from um, Crowley because even though the two were contemporaries, they they never. I can't find anywhere. I mean, I was interested whether they ever corresponded or whether they ever their cro- their paths ever crossed, but I don't. I can't find anywhere that they did. If you if you know about that, if you found that, please um, leave that in the comments afterwards. But I can't. It would seem natural because, you know, how Crowley knew all these people. And it would make sense that he knew uh, Houdini, especially because, you know, Al Crowley knew, of course, Yates from the Golden Dawn and then um, Al, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. But and then Houdini became friends with Arthur Conan Doyle. And then they then they had a sort of a falling out because Co- Conan Doyle was a uh, pretty strict believer in the the spiritualism of the 20th cent- of the early 20th century, which. We're going to go into what that means. That's yeah. That's when they were all doing all these seances and all this, all this stuff. And we're going to find that Houdini was a debunker of a lot of these people, but not for the reasons you might think. You you may know this if you're watching this already. So forgive me if you do. But Houdini was not a debunker of the spiritualism and the and the seances because he thought it was nonsense. He was a debunker of it because he believed it was real and that these particular people were ripping people off. But he was a uh, pretty strict believer that you could communicate with the dead. And um, there was one instance when he was with Arthur Conan Doyle where he uh, debunked a particular seance that they both um, that they both attended. And the the medium um, claimed that she had a message from uh, the other side, as she said, um, that was Houdini's mother. But there were problems with it, which we'll go into, and that is that's one reason why he railed it. And he even again, he even tried to 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 uh, sponsor a law through Congress, which was which wasn't passed. It was unsuccessful, and that that itself also drove Houdini to um, sort of mad heights because he realized that you know for all of his talents and stuff, he was no public orator, 
Um, but that didn't, that, that doesn't really matter. Um, so, so what are the things that drove him? Well, this says, if a man has an instinct stronger than self-preservation, it is the instinct to escape from bondage, the American liberty or death, right? Liberty or death, which is, which was the speech given right down the road here in Richmond. Oh, Patrick Henry. Cherished among folk heroes are the liberators, Moses and the Maccabees, Garibaldi and Bolivar. And down the years, the adventures of great prison breaks, breakers have made pulses race. Um, including Henri de Latude, who dangled his way precariously out of the Bastille down a rope ladder several hundred feet long, woven from linen threads. Such tales stir the soul as with the voice of a trumpet, but they are tales at best conveyed by the printed word, this book says. Then, at the turn of the 20th century, there arose from the ranks of obscure music hall magicians a man who captured the imagination of two continents and held the limelight firmly focused on himself for 20 years. He, he did this. He did it by hammering out a brand new form of entertainment in which he acted out the dream of every man, escaped from bonds by magic. Great as he was, his new art did not burst full form from his own genius. It had a long and fascinating history of gradual growth. The art is always engaged as perhaps it touches us more deeply than we know. Glance first at these scenes. They are a part of our fabulous history of magic and of the man who made its practice in life. Okay, then the book is pretty interesting because it goes into the, kind of goes into what um, our homeboy Cotizi over there, Cotel at Church of the Eternal Logos would be interested in and, and, and is an expert in, which is these sort of ancient shamanistic practices and it talks about the tribes and the the rites of passage and the rituals which um, allowed the magician to lead his tribe and to escape from from a sort of a bondage. And that is a kind of a a prerequisite in terms of the study of Houdini. Now, um, one thing that's interesting that I considered here is that. It's fascinating. Okay, so it's fascinating to consider that um, Houdini is known and people love him um, or loved him back then and continue to know him because uh, because they, uh, let's see, I'm overloaded. Hopefully I'm not redlining. Oh. Because they uh, relate to his uh, escape from bondage, right? They, they relate to him being a liberator. But the irony is that it's Houdini himself who put himself into the bonds and strictly controlled the way that he that that he was able to break out of these chains, and he he even controlled the publicity associated with it. So what that means essentially is that yes, um, Houdini would hang from chains uh you know like over a city block and there'd be forty thousand people watching but the thing is that and they loved him because like he could break free but he's the one who arranged the whole thing and he put himself into the chains does that make sense so that will tie in later with uh the i don't know about accusations but the thoughts of uh espionage um because of his relationship with authorities. And that will especially tie into an incident that um, happened in Russia. And that's one of the things that people will point to when they talk about his espionage activities because he was reporting for the Anglo-American establishment, so they say, because um, of the escape he made when he toured Russia. Now, Houdini is interesting because he did have audiences with the royal family. I think he visited the czar three times. Uh, he was, they even tried to make him an ambassador. He knew um, Teddy Roosevelt. He was summoned to Washington by um, Wilson. He knew a lot of the rich and famous people, of course. Um, and he knew the literati. He knew the movie stars. He knew he lived in Hollywood, uh, the Houdini Mansion. Of course, the Houdini Mansion is not really the Houdini mansion in the one in Hollywood, because you may know this because if you're fan, like, if you know about like Rick Rubin, the producer, right. Um, the, the he produced the blood sugar sex magic album. So, you know, obviously the, that's a whole other stream. The, the name of the, of the red Hot chili peppers album is a 
specifically and direct, you know, it's a direct Al Crowley album title. It also deals with, you know, drugs and all, all of the stuff with that band, but whatever. Um, Rick Rubin produced that album in an old mansion that was said to be owned by Errol Flynn. Now, th that, that mansion was rebuilt like in the like late 40s because it had burned down. So Houdini didn't actually live in that particular mansion, but he did live on the spot. Um, the mansion that he lived on in, um, on, in Harlem in West 113th Street in New York City is still there. You know, it has, it's like private ownership now. But, um, so, so this says, this says on page eight of this book, um, that, let's see, it says, circle drawn on the ground in the place of talking symbolized for the council, the horizon on which the rest the sky, right? The magic circle. Five stout saplings trimmed of branches were sunk three feet into the ground. Earth was then packed hard around the sapling's base, covering of moose hide draped the place of invocation so that no profane gaze could spy on sacred mystery. Then the magician came forward to stand in the firelight, naked save for the pelt of a beaver worn like an apron, and on his head a medicine bonnet bearing the stuffed heads of an eagle, owl, crane, and loon. It's interesting that with the apron, because um, because Houdini was a mason, uh, self-professed, and then at his funeral there was a, a Masonic ceremony. He saluted the four winds with proper ceremony. That's straight. That's magic with a K, right? At last, he began to call down the spirits of the ancient great from their ghost dance in the northern heavens. One of the tribe's bravest warriors, known to be an expert at confining prisoners with strips of hide, then came forward. The magician held out his left wrist so that the hide might be knotted firmly about it. He crossed his hands behind his back, and the right wrist was tied tightly to the left. Other strips fastened his ankles. Though he was helpless now, his feet were drawn up and lashed to his wrist. Do you see where this is going with the Houdini? Solemn Braves lifted the trust man and carried him into the tent, left open at the top to admit the spirits of the air. Hoot of the owl, gabble of the loon. From the high-walled enclosure only wide enough to allow the jackknife magician to lie across it, rose a chorus of unearthly sounds. The watching crowd moaned as ghostly fingers twitched the moose hide walls. This demonic ceremony. The medicine lodge shook. The poles bent from side to side. Obviously, spirits had descended. For a, a tied, helpless man could not make strong walls tremble. The council fire died. Embers glowed. But the cries of the bird and beast still sounded. The howling of great winds. The snapping of ghostly fingers. The steady rasp of the tortoise shell rattle came from the tent, shaking now as in great winds. As the embers, as the embers lost their light, tiny flecks of green fire appeared around the tent. A green, of, again. Uh, I, who was it? today that brought up was it our homeboy john shouts out to john out there who i think brought up the green light we've we've seen the green we saw it of course in the wizard of oz stream and in the um in the return to oz that we we keep getting this symbolism of green as being associated with the occult of course we saw this in in great gatsby um in Macbeth. all knew that the shades of dead warriors would give wisdom to their people now they announced their presence. Each spoke his name, a chief whose deeds were tribal legend counseled war in a full-throated voice. Who could think this was the voice of the conjurer? The ghost chief hinted of danger. The tents shaking made more awesome his words. Then the spirits were gone. The strong saplings no longer shook. The elders found the conjurer as firmly bound as ever. Now, in the lecture hall, ladies settled the enormous skirts decreed by fashion in the 1860s. There would be a demonstration now at which they could only wonder. An, an old gentleman walked to the center of the platform and paused for quiet. With the silvery voice of a popular preacher, but with an underlying note of complete sincerity, it says, but, that's an interesting conjunction. Um, he told the strange history of the two young men now to appear, set to appear, and of their seeming power to call spirits from the vasty deep of the motion incredibly imparted to objects placed near them, even though the lads would be firmly tied by volunteers from the audience. To a round of applause broken by a few boos and hisses from skeptics, he introduced the Wondrous Brothers, Ira Erastus and William Henry Davenport. Now, this is the, again, this is the prerequisite for, for an understanding of Houdini because the, the spiritualism movement of the vaudeville acts especially of the Victorian era. We all know because we've, we've read this and we've seen this so many times in our streams and our friends' streams where this came from, right? This kind of, this sort of post-enlightenment then melding into British Romanticism and then um, sort of 
transforming into this kind of worship of nature and going back to nature. And then finally in the, the Victorian colonialism and, and uh, the contact with the, the international world and all these international peoples. And then finally into a strict occult into the, the, the way that the occult use this, especially in, for instance, the, the Golden Dawn would be the best example of this. But, like, society in general was fascinated by this at the time, right? You know, Western society. And Houdini, as a child, was was fascinated by this. Uh, Houdini was born Eric Weiss, and um, he was, like, the fifth son or something. Uh, and he was four years old. He was born in Budapest. Born in Buda, right? Not Pest. In Hungary. Uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, I suppose, and then moved to Appleton, Wisconsin, age four, went, you know, through the, through Ellis Island and all that stuff. But he was the, basically, they were poor, and then he was introduced to this when he was a kid, so the story goes, right? And then this is like, he he developed a talent for this. And he started, he started wanting to help out his poor family by like, basically doing circus acts. But um, it's funny. I looked on IMDb and it's, it said he was 5'7". He was not 5'7". Every book clearly sh- sh- says that he was 5'4". He was a very small guy, but he was completely, I mean, he was totally hewn and muscular and and was a true, you know, circus vaudeville, vaudeville performer. Um, a physical, was able to do any kind of physical acts, physical comedy. Obviously, he could do that. He was a contortionist. But, um, where it really gets interesting is when the book starts to discuss, first of all, his he chose his name because um, he picked up a book. And this is interesting because it this is the same thing that happens with Crowley, and it's the same thing that even that happens with uh, the jerk character, right, in uh, Nightmare Alley, right? He finds a book, and the book has these, you know, professes these secrets, and his book was a book on magic. Um, it's called The Memoirs of Robert Houdin, Ambassador, Author, and Conjurer, written by himself. Houdin, H-O-U-D-I-N, was the name of this guy. So, of course, uh, Eric Weiss chose his stage name, which later became Harry Houdini, right? He added the I to it uh, as, a, as a familiarity. So later on, by the way, he went to the house, he was in Paris, and he went to the house of the widow of this guy. And he wanted to go in and meet his, you know, meet his master, his idol. And basically he was turned away at the door. You know, they were saying, they said basically, you know, scram, short round. And uh, he was so pissed off at this. Like Houdini had grudges, lifelong. And that will lead that will lead into the speculation about his death. But they told Short Round to uh, scram, and then he wrote a book debunking everything that Houdin ever did and wanted to destroy his legend. But of course, he kept the name, right? But when this will become really interesting is when we see that Houdini develops like these specific things that we we still know him for, which are the the uh, his ability to to his regurgitation abilities. So like, do you want to talk, do you want to hear about some of the, um, some of his tricks? I don't know if you guys want to hear about some of his tricks, but this is interesting because not just for the, it, it's interesting just on the surface to hear about this guy who could do all these things. But one thing that Houdini said was that um, the, the sort of society of magicians is naturally enclosed and secretive, right? And that they are, you know, naturally don't want to give away their tricks. And, but it, but at the same time, it's incredibly cutthroat. And so like, if you've seen the prestige movie, that's a pretty good example of how a magician, uh, a magician in terms of like an escaped escape artist or performer, I'm not talking about magicians yet, um, would, would watch another magician perform an act and then would essentially steal the act and then improve upon it. Um, and, Houdini supposedly was pretty generous with buying the acts of other people so that, you know, he wasn't just, he wasn't just stealing their act, but he would buy the act and then improve upon it. Not, not many of his acts 
were original because, or is even his act, his individual performances or activities because, and he said this, like he took them from, uh, other acts that were ancient and they were, they were really old. I mean, think of the, the magicians and the sorcerers, uh, you know, in, in Exodus and, and this is, but what he did was, was slightly different. So what he said was, and what it says in the book, and I found this really interesting was that, um, he said that every time a, like a well-known scientist, for instance, would come and try to figure out how he was able to do these escapes and how he was able to do stuff. They could never figure it out because so there was something that was stopping them that they could, they couldn't ever get their mind around. He said that the scientist uh, was always trying to look for some sort of logical explanation in terms of how he could escape from, for instance, the Chinese water torture cell, right? Or the milk, the milk, like the milk bottle trick. It, what he did was, he had himself locked in a like a it's a it's a big milk bottle. It, they call it a milk bottle. It's like a big jug, and they would screw the they would screw it on tightly, and they could never figure out like how he got out of this stuff because there was no there was no logical way. But the reason they couldn't figure it out is because they didn't have the mind of the escape artist or of the trickster, and the trickster, which is what he, he essentially was, was the person who would break the rules to escape, but in a way nobody else could figure out. Okay. So, so for example, um, one thing that he did, he used this with his like regurgitation ability. So, so he started off, I'm just going to kind of freestyle now through the book, through some of his tricks. He started off by learning, um, how to swallow sewing needles. And he learned, he learned this because he was studying the sword swallowers, like the, the Asiatic sword swallowers. And he learned that, um, people thought, yes, he cheated. And so, so people thought that, you know, they would think that, okay, this, this woman's up there and she's like swallowing a sword. So she must be like turning her side to the audience and she's not really swallowing it or the sword would shrink or whatever. But what he found was that they really were swallowing this. And now we, I know everybody watching this knows this, but they really were swallowing the swords, but it was because they had trained their mind and their body to relax the esophagus. And so when he would swallow something, for instance, like, like a, a needle, right. Or a knife, he, he would keep it in his esophagus and then he was able to regurgitate it. And he did, but it wasn't just like one thing. Like he, there was the, the early trick that he did where he regurgitated like 140 sewing needles on a string. And that would, would would seriously damage you on the inside, but because of his because of his practice, he never did anything that he couldn't completely control, and so he knew he could do it. And then what he did this this is really interesting. What he did was so for the Chinese water torture trick and for the underwater tricks. Like for instance, there was the trick where where like he was tied to a ball and chain, and then he he jumped off the bridge like in Detroit into the frozen river. And, and, uh, and so people are like, how, how could he do this? Well, he could hold his breath for three minutes underwater. He, you know, he had a, an astounding ability to, to do all sorts of physical feats, but what he would do is, um, okay. Okay. Sidetrack. Okay. So I'm gonna give you the most famous example. When he was on tour in the South Pacific, he took a, he took a, uh, the steamship to Australia. By the way, when he was in Australia, did you know that he's the first person to uh, do a solo flight and land a plane without crashing it in Australia? He's first in flight in Australia. I didn't know that. But one of the things that he did was when he was on the way back was they stopped and they saw by, by Fiji and they saw these natives like diving for coins and people would throw gold coins into the ocean and they would come up with the coins in their mouth. And he said, that's easy. I can, I can do that. And they were like, no, you can't. He was like, yeah, I can't watch me. So he said, let's make it a little harder. Um, handcuff me and I'll do it. So what he did was they handcuffed him behind his back. He dove in. He would, he knew that coins, when you drop coins in water, they don't fall, they don't drop straight down, but he knew the pattern. They do a, what he calls a sidestep. So the coin kind of drops to the side and then side and then side. So he would unlock the he would unlock the the handcuffs underwater um he would catch it in his hand he would put it in his mouth he would put the handcuffs back on and then come up and he would have the coin 
And that seems also to be like wild. Like, how did he get out of the handcuffs? Well, and I know, again, I pretend if you know this stuff, like you don't know it if you're watching, because I know it's it's probably elementary to a lot of people. But but the handcuff thing is interesting because he could escape from any handcuffs because Houdini found out that at the time, no matter where you were in the world, there were like seven different kinds of handcuffs. That's it. And most of the handcuffs opened with a simple, they were, they may be elaborate on the outside, but they opened with a simple locking mechanism. And so everywhere Houdini went, he collected handcuffs and he collected keys. So he had like every key. So what he would do is um, he would, by misdirection, when he was being handcuffed, for instance, um, he would, he would, sometimes he would get like, let's say a, a, you know, they would handcuff him. They would put him in a straight jacket or whatever. And then his wife would come up and give him a kiss because it's like, oh, he's going to die. Right. And this might be the last kiss. Well, when she kissed him, she would pass him the key. He would. And then he would. It wasn't just that. It was that he would also be searched so he could swallow the entire key. And sometimes he would do his, his stunts completely nude. And then when he was away from the eyes of people watching like inside the the dunk tank or inside the whatever he would regurgitate the key but the the problem again is like how do you get the key into the lock if you're if it's behind your back well he could dislocate his 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 shoulders that's how he got out of the straight jackets and sometimes he would attach like mechanisms to the end of the key so that he could regurgitate the key but it would be like on a long stem and then he would use that he would put that in his mouth and then he would unlock it which is pretty cool um, in terms of like, it, it's pretty ingenious, like the ways that he was able to cheat this stuff. Now, the most, one of the most famous ones is the, the trick that he did in Russia. And when he went to Russia, he said, let me see if I can find this in here. Um, when he went to Russia, he said that he could escape from, I forget the name of the vehicle. Um, it's the, it starts with a P. Basically, okay, so so when he went to Russia, they said, there's no way you can escape from us. We have the tightest security, and we're going to put you in this um, this uh, carriage, and and we we know you can't escape from it. So what they did was they put him in the – they allowed him to inspect it first. And he said, okay. So – and what, what would happen is when Houdini would inspect something first, he would always have like a piece of – some sort of carpenter's like sticky putty either on his shoe or on his hand or somewhere on his body. And he was able to take an impression of the key and then he would get the key made. And he could, he could, he could use his fingers. Like, I mean, his toes like fingers, which is crazy. Um, and that played into this one because he was totally, they stripped him totally nude. They even did a body cavity search to see if he had anything, any keys on him, but they locked him in this um, carriage and the carriage was used to transport political prisoners from Moscow to Siberia. And there was no way out of it. It was completely sealed in steel. But when Houdini uh, inspected it, he found that what he would do is he said, he said, all right, look, um, I'll get out of it, back the carriage up uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's four walls and a top and a bottom. So he said, all right, back the, back the um the back of the carriage up to the wall so you can't see me trying to escape. Now that was misdirection. They assumed that he would try to escape through the back door. But because that was the only door, right? But what he did was he had a uh, a special saw and it was a little minuscule little saw and the saw was able to cut through the zinc. The floor was made of a softer zinc and had a soft underbelly. The rest of it was steel, but there was a zinc bottom. And he had, he had hidden it. Uh, I think that's the one where he had hidden it in his false. Th he had a false thumb. Like he would use false fingers, and he had he had um like skin like grafted onto his fingers, so he was able to conceal tools inside of his skin. Um, another. Uh, so so basically, they were looking at the back of the um at the back of the carriage, and they thought he would come out of there, but instead he popped out like he popped out, and he was on the top of the thing. But it's because he'd gotten out of the bottom of the carriage and then crawled around the back up onto the top. And there he was, and he appeared. Um, and another thing that he did was uh, when he was, like, for instance, when he was underwater, he had a steel plate um, in his, like, in his knee with skin covering it. So so if he was handcuffed, 
then he would be able to strike the handcuffs against the steel plate and he would and and let himself out. So it was really ingenious. Like he had all these little tricks. Um, but that that like is just the that's just the performance. Like the thing that really made Houdini is not the fact that he could escape. It's it's the fact that he could escape in a dramatic way. So he would take, like, he could escape from any of these things in, like, three minutes. But he would take, like, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, like, playing up the drama of it to act like it was life and death. Because he said that, like, every, he said that the audience doesn't want to, like, they they don't, it's not whether they want to see you die. It's that they want to think that you can die, but then they want to see you appear, but they, they block off their, their senses as to how this could like actually happen. It was all through misdirection. Um, so another thing that happened was, let's see. Um, let's see the, okay. On page. On page 34, we get the wild man, which is the, uh, like the wild man, which is like the jerk, right, in um, in the Nightmare Alley. And that, and Houdini was that guy, by the way, um, but he was, but he faked it. So it says, the show had a banner advertising a wild man, a remnant from a previous season when its personnel contained some muscular, dark-skinned lad who could portray a savage. The absence of the attraction usually went unnoticed, but one night a crowd of local toughs began clamoring for the wild man and threatening to tear down the hall, the whole blame show, unless he was produced. John Welsh had for years survived by thinking fast in emergencies. He yelled to Houdini, hey, kid, you with the mop of hair, throw some paint on your face and get in the crate. We got to have a wild man. So Harry did as his boss and contract said. He improvised a costume. Um, his grunts and growls were so convincing that the business stayed in show. He carried away, away by success, the ringmaster conceived a master stroke. He described the native lair of the wild man, the steaming jung jungles of Borneo, and told how when captured, the creature would eat nothing but raw meat, although he had since learned to eat cigars. Spectators at once tested this statement. Houdini, by sleight of hand, seemed to put the cigars in his mouth. He chewed and swallowed with fine effects. Since Harry never smoked, the circus personnel shared the cigars afterwards. Sleight of hand, otherwise known as leisure domain. Uh, leisure domain is a word I learned in the eighth grade because there was a band uh, at school. One of the best bands I've ever seen. Uh, and it was these guys, it was these dudes two years older than me and they were in this badass band and they were called Leisure Domain. And they played, they played like, uh, you know, Alice in Chains and this was in the nineties. They were called Leisure Domain. Anyway, uh, among the circus acts was a troop of Japanese acrobats, one of whom Sam Kitchy, Houdini endeavored to teach English. In return, Sam prevailed upon an old Japanese with the troop to teach Harry some of his feats. One of these was regurgitation. The old man was what is known in the sideshows as a swallower. He could produce ivory balls from nowhere, juggle them, catch that one in his mouth, and apparently swallow it. Certainly when he opened his mouth, there was no trace of it. Then with suitable grimaces, he would produce it from between his lips. It did not remain in his mouth, nor was it actually swallowed. It was half swallowed. That is, he had mastered the technique of letting an object pass down his esophagus, but stop halfway. By a retro peristalsis, he could fetch it up again, none the worse. Accomplished performers of the art could do it with frogs, goldfish, watches, coins, and even live mice. Unini never tried it with any frogs or mice, but the feat itself, like all such sideshow wonders, fascinated him. The old man told him to practice with a small potato on a string so that if it got away from him, it would be digested without harmful results. Right? Pretty wild. Um, also, next um, is the handcuff trick, and that's all about, like, selling the trick. It's not about the trick. See, the tricks were easy for him, but it was the ability to sell the audience. Now, why does all this matter? Aside from just like straight entertainment, this is what convinced Arthur Conan Doyle that Houdini was the real thing. He was convinced that Houdini was some sort of demon. And Houdini was always quick to say, look, man, I'm just a performer. It's all, it's all fake, right? It's all, it's all just, it's, it's, it's magic, but it's not occult magic. It's just, it's just tricks. But that doesn't mean that there's not something occult with it. I mean, because, look, Houdini, um, 
had the lar- again, he had the largest collection of magic and occult books. He willed them to the library economy. Mean, he had a huge everywhere he went, he got he got stuff. This is also a dude who um he collected the books, he collected magic tricks, he collected all this stuff, but he also um he also like frequented insane asylums. Everywhere he went, he went to asylums. And and that's obviously weird on itself in itself, but Obviously, the reason for that is because one, uh, one thing that happened was um, Houdini, when he was in, on tour in Germany, he he saw that um, they they had perf- the Germans, of course, had perfected a way to to uh, to restrain a, an insane person without the use of a straitjacket. Uh, Houdini was around when the straitjacket came around, and that's why he got the straitjacket. You know, he was. They let him borrow a straight jacket and then he made one. So of course he made the straight jacket. Anything that he did in performances, he either made or like when he was locked down in, he did the, uh, the safe escape trick. Like they locked him in a safe, but he contacted the, the company that made the safes and was able to install like shorter screws in the side. So they would be undetectable by people who were like trying to look through the, through the safe to see if there was any way out. But he knew that like a quick knock on the, on the screws would allow him to get out one side and then to perform his, you know, to take the rest of the time in, in the show, the show act of getting out of this thing. Um, He also owned, he never patented any of his tricks because when you, when you patent something, you have to show all of the, the, the way that it works, right? It all has to be exposed. It's all, it's all open and transparent. So instead he copyrighted things like with a single guy in the audience, but, um, he did collect patent papers. So for instance, like if there was, if there was a new patent on a safe or a lock mechanism, he, he went and he got it, he owned it because he had to know every single thing about all the tricks, which is pretty interesting. Um, the, the handcuff trick, it says, like many, let's see, um, let's see, uh, it says, the experience of the circus was good for him. He still had not learned to sell the handcuff trick, but he used it to spice up the trunk mystery. Instead of the strips of braid, cuffs now secured his hands behind his back. He escaped, appearing suddenly outside the trunk. Then he unlocked, unstrapped, unclasped, and opened the trunk itself. When he untied the bag within, Bess was in, Bess was his wife. And his partner in magic, in the magic and escape act tricks, was inside the cuffs on her tiny wrist. Harry now began studying can- handcuffs with his own special intensity. In pawn shop, pawn shops, cuffs were displayed in windows surrounded by blackjacks, revolvers, and field glasses. There were, it seemed, several kinds. He acquired pairs. He acquired pairs of different makes, but even when three pairs were snapped on his wrists at once. His escape with his hands hidden by a magic foyard caused no sensation. Many spectators guessed that he was only using duplicate keys, but he wasn't. Of their $25 circus salary, the Houdini sent $12 home to their to Houdini's mother. And they ate in the cook tent of the circuses. And the circus slept on the cot in the living car, which at least offered shelter from the rain, and they saved their money. They're like total circus people. Now, my own um my own story about the circus, if you guys are interested, because I, I have a, a a brief brush with the circus. And I told you, that, I told you all this before. Was um, when I was in uh, when I was in drama school, um, my final year in drama school in England. We our final uh, performance was this uh, play about the the plague in the Middle Ages, and uh, it's called uh, Red Noses by Peter Barnes, and. Um, and the whole thing is a circus act. It's all performed in a circus. And so what happens is, well, I was, my part was, it was, it was my friend Jeff and I had to play two, um, two guys who like, we had to walk on a ball the entire play. So all of our lines, all of our parts were on a ball, you know, like in the circus, you see the, and especially in the Chinese circus and the acrobats, they have to walk on a ball. So we had to learn to walk on a ball, but part of the training was uh, we had three months to do it. And they said, all right, you guys need to, you know, one guy was a trapeze artist. uh, One guy was a, you know, stilt walker. One guy to walk on his hands. And so it's, it's, it's just a surreal, whatever play, you know, but we were, none of us were, we were just like actors. 
So they sent us to a circus school outside Bristol, and uh, that was pretty cool because they taught us the tricks. And one thing that's cool about circus school, this is like this is like the proverbial clown school, but these guys weren't. You know, they they learned to be clowns or whatever. But um, the circus performers go to a specific school, like in a big top. And so one the the I'll get to how they taught us to walk on the ball, but like basically it was cool because like at lunch we would all gather like in the grass and we'd sit down and eat lunch and the circus school students would all like come out and like onto the grass, but like they were basically they were in character all the time. So like the dude who was the hand walker always walked on his hands. Um, the guy who was the trapeze artist, like had a rope between two trees and stood on a, on a rope, like eating his lunch. It was wild. These are like, these are like, obviously these are like bizarre people. I mean, it was bizarre enough to be an actor, but these people are like bizarre people, but like, they are the most, they're the fittest like people you've ever seen. They're just all physical. It's just all muscle. And so the way that this kid kid. I mean, he was probably just a little bit younger than me, but taught, taught us to walk on the ball was the hard part is like getting up on the ball itself. Cause the ball is like about two feet high. Right. So you put the ball anywhere and you think like you immediately just standing up on it, you're going to fall off. It's like the first time you ride a bike. Like if you, the first time you get on a bike, you're just going to topple over one way, but with the ball, it's you topple over any which way. But what he said basically was that like, I mean, basically, it was like you have, first of all, you have to believe that you can walk on the ball. And that sounds so stupid, but there's this like cognitive thing where you get over the fact that like if you fall, you're going to be all right. And I never fell. And, and what he said was basically like you got to learn how to walk backwards, but you're walking forwards. So, like, when you walk forwards, your feet are sort of moving, your feet are moving like this and you're moving this way. But when you're standing on a ball, you're like this. And if you're going to go this way, your feet have to walk forwards like this. So you're basically walking with like the soles of your feet pushing forward. And if you want to go backwards, it's the other way. And you have to have like a, you know, they talk about core strength. You, you have to be, first you have to learn to stand perfectly straight up and still, and it's all balanced like with your core. But the first time you stand on the ball is difficult because like the way I did it was nobody would, you just have to do it yourself. So I would go into the little studio at, you know, and I'd stand at one end and I'd roll the ball and then I'd run around to the other side and I would just jump onto the ball and just, you just stand up on it. And the first time I could stand on it was like a big deal. And then, but then for the performance, because we were playing old men, we had to learn how to like walk with a stoop. So our balance is all off, but we're still on the ball, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know, it's whatever it, it was, it's, it's an interesting experience, but what that has to do with this is basically just that, you know, that the things that people think they can, they can't do physically is what is where like Houdini made his, that that's how he did. He was the master of all these things. So for instance, you know, um, probably a lot of people have seen the video of him. Like they hoisted him up above like New York and he's on the crane and he's in the straight jacket and he's hanging upside down. Right. So he has to get out of it. Well, the day that they did that, the wind was blowing and it was blowing him into the wall and everybody, you know, it added to the drama of the event, but it was actually good for Houdini because the force of him, of the wind blowing him into the wall allowed him to dislocate his shoulder more easily and to shimmy out of, and to squirm out of the, out of the straight jacket. Um, he also had various other tricks that he could do, which, which was like, if he was in a straight jacket, for instance, or if he was in some sort of cloth he couldn't get out of, he would he would regurgitate that tiny saw that he had. Um, or he would have it sit hidden somewhere on his body. The thing about Germany that I was mentioning was that um, when he got to Germany, they devised an ingenious way of restraining people without a without a uh, straight jacket, and that was the wet sheet um, method, which was basically that they would wrap a person, they would make a guy stand there and they would wrap him in a bed sheet really tightly and they would wrap him and wrap him and wrap him and then they would douse him with water. And what that did was it, it, the water obviously strengthened the sheet so much that he couldn't get out of it. But the, he found that in terms of the inmates themselves who were like this, they were less likely to try to escape from 
the straight jacket because they felt like they were ensconced in a protected womb. And then he tried to incorporate that in his act, but nobody cared about it because it wasn't as dramatic as the straight jacket. Now that ties into one of the things that uh, one of the like speculations about his, his espionage activity or his spying, because obviously there are a few things to consider here. One is that his wealth of knowledge about like all of these different institutions and installations would be really um, useful to people of, let's say, of another like of a foreign intelligence agency, right? For instance, um, when he when he got to England, he went to England penniless, and that's again one of the things that I'm going to get into here is that um, his first act, he went from basically being penniless to contacting uh, the head of the one of the police organizations in Chicago who set him up with the deal. And a, a lot of his, it is weird that a lot of his more famous deals, um, his, his more famous activities deal with like escaping from the bonds of like the police. So the police would be on hand. Now all the public see, sees that as like, this guy can escape from anything and it gives us hope. But it, it's also like, oh, it's a, you know, it's PR and all this stuff. It also makes them famous. But it's also like, hmm, if there's ever anybody that we need to escape from one of these places, this is interesting. So when he went to England, one of the first people that he apparently met was this guy, William Melville, who gave him um, and taught him some escape techniques. And um, Melville, again, is the guy who was, he was head of Scotland Yard, special branch. He ended up being the guy who supposedly founded MI5, specifically MI5. Now, when, when Houdini did this, one of the first deals that he set up in England was that he went to the prison and he did an escape from the bowels of the jail and the jail cell. And when he did that, he actually let out all the inmates on the bottom floor. I don't know what happened to him, but he let him out. Um, when he went to Russia and he did that trick, the same thing happened. So you would think that maybe somebody would be interesting in learning about how they transport prisoners from one place to Siberia. Um, or about the inner workings of of the Czar and his court because he met with the Czar three times. Um, he also did a seance with Teddy Roosevelt, which is interesting. Did you know that? And again, this is not to say when he later debunked um, all the seances, it's not because Houdini didn't believe in seances. It was because... He believed that seances were real, and he was a spiritualist in terms of, like, the early 20th century, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century uh, spiritualist in terms of, like, believing in seances and communication with the dead, right, which is, you know, demonic magic. Um, but he believed this was real, and he wanted to contact his mother. He learned about the death of his mother through, pre first of all, he had a premonition. He wrote about it in his diary. He had a premonition that his mother was dead, and then he was in Sweden uh, at the court of the king in Sweden when he learned that his mother was dead um, and he immediately fainted and, and got sick and then came back to America. And then that is what led him to want to um, be able to contact his mother. Now, when he was with Arthur Conan Doyle and they did this, fa this famous seance, um, what happened was they claimed, the medium claimed that she had contacted uh, Houdini's mother, but there were some simple like errors that he, that he called out and he, and his point was to say that like mediums exist, but this person is a fraud and they're defrauding you and everything that you believe in as far as this goes is wrong, but they, but it does exist. So for instance, the medium came back with a message from beyond from his mother, but the message was written in English and they didn't know that Houdini's mother didn't speak English. Um, also, what was the other thing? Um, there was another part of it. Uh, uh, also, oh, also, um, the the medium claimed that uh, she was well, she was like possessed, and she made the sign of the cross, but she didn't know that Houdini's mother was Jewish. Um, also, there was one other thing that I forget, but basically, he called out he called out Conan Doyle, and he was like, "These, these people, this is fake." Then he went on to do the congressional testimony, which is which is odd because after the congressional testimony, what happened was um, his wife came down with food poisoning. He got sick and he was like never sick. I mean, he was he was incredibly strong at a, a tough constitution, but then he got sick. Then he broke his ankle in a trick 
And then he went to he he still did the trick anyway. And then he was in the dressing room, and that's when the three guys who were doctors came in. Do you remember this? You guys remember this story? These three young guys came in, and they said, hey, Houdini, you can take a punch from anybody, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I can take a punch from anybody. I can withstand any kind of pain. And they were like, do you mind if we do it? And Houdini was like, yeah, uh, I don't mind if you do it. Go ahead. And the guy was like, bam, and socked him in the stomach before he'd even gotten up from the sofa. And this was like a young medical student. I forget his name, Apple Appleton or something. Um, and immediately he like curled over in pain. And then he was like, no, no, no. But but most people don't know, he actually let the kid do it again. And this time he, you know, he strengthened his core and the guy punched him. And it was he said it was like punching oak. But when that happened, um, Houdini then went on to perform again. He did. He continued to do his routine after that. And then he got... Um, appendicitis and then he died of uh uh peritonitis or whatever nine days later now so like the stupid debunkers are like no he didn't die of the punch in the stomach he died of appendicitis nine days later well the guy ruptured his his appendix but that is pro that is not the end of it so this occurred after houdini had debunked the what what he called the blonde witch of boston now, the Blonde Witch of Boston was this woman. Um, let me find her name real quick. Uh, her name was Mina Crandon. Okay, so so Mina Crandon was this unlikely medium, really famous. But her husband was this guy, Leroy Crandon, or Leroy Crandon. And Leroy Crandon was a Harvard-educated doctor. Now. This is where it gets wild. Um, he went and he debunked this guy. And they, Houdini even wrote about this. Um, and they wrote about it in their diaries that the favorite method of the spiritualists in terms of revenge was poison. So it's interesting that his wife got food poisoning and then he got, he was sick and then he died. So we don't know whether the stomach punch actually did it or whether he was poisoned, whether the, I mean, the guy probably didn't go in attempting to assassinate him by punching him in the stomach. Um, that might have just been a ruse or whatever. But the problem is you don't know about any of this because because everything dealing with Houdini is about illusion and about controlling the publicity around it. So, for instance, like when he jumps off a bridge into the frozen river, he has him cut a hole in the ice. So he jumps over and then there's a you know, there's like a rope underneath. So he does. He's not dragged away under the river. Uh, in the current of the river and he's able to come back up. But later they're like, no, he jumped into a frozen river through the ice and he's like, yeah, maybe I did that. So in other words, um, his, his, his like talent for equivocation, right. To leave out parts of the convenient truth only strengthened his, his public persona. Like he was, whenever there was like a, a big public headline or there was something put in the news about him, you know, doing some sort of spectacular feat, a uh, spectacular feat. Uh, it was likely that he himself planted it just like when he was going to be locked in a house in a, in a safe, he was the one who contacted the maker of the safe to arrange the special making of the safe, or he caught, he, or he found the patent details or he found the plans or he had somebody on the inside or he had all these different methods. And, and that's why the espionage thing is so strong because there's a natural um, there's a natural secrecy built into his into his act and into his whole life and the lifestyle of all the other people around him. That's why you know Jay's talked about this so much, like that magicians are naturally like contacted by espionage because they deal with illusion, right? Just like the mob and intelligence can work together so naturally because there's a code of silence built into both. Also, he was a Mason. So there's another layer of a code of silence. Um, when he did the uh, walking through walls trick and the making the elephant disappear trick, which he did on stage, um, he was careful to not let any of the stage hands stand on the sides of the stage so that they could tell what was going on. That's the same thing that happens in The Prestige. You remember in The Prestige at the end of the film, the great film, by the way, and that's a Christopher Nolan film that I like. And I'll be going over that one in full uh, this month after I get the book, read the book. 
Um, we'll be talking about the book and the film. One of the things that happens um, in the film uh, towards the end, remember, is that um, that the stagehands are blind because he says he doesn't want to let the stagehands see what's good. He's like, no, Michael Caine. Michael, Michael Caine's like, Fuck, I was going to be backstage on this Master Wayne. And he's like, no, I want you front of house. I want you front of house on this one because he doesn't want him backstage because of what happens in the film. And I'm not, I won't give that away right now. If you've seen it, then you know what I'm talking about. I know. I wonder if the, I wonder if the kaleidoscopic um, changing color of the books is affecting the drop frames on the thing. I don't know enough about tech to explain that, but I'm sure it's just me moving around and I have too high of a resolution on the film, on the video. That's because I got this badass new um, laptop and I still need to tweak it a little bit. So I hope you guys are enjoying this, you know, for what it is. We're just having fun talking about Houdini. I mean, some some might say, yeah, who cares about Houdini? What's the relevance now? Well, I think it's relevant because, again, because it deals with the ties and the correlation between celebrity uh, and internationalism, secrecy, illusion, the confidence man. Um, the ability to, yeah, Ruby's like, right, for Master, Master Wayne. Ma, Ma, Master Wayne. I heard Michael King Price, Master Wayne. Master Wayne. When I was in Burma, we found rubies the size of grapefruits. Some people just want to see the world burn. Right before I came on here, by the way, I saw Mike Lindell commercial. Huh. And the one that I did on on our New Year's Eve stream with Jerry, shouts out to Jerry right there. By the way, I was impressed with myself because I did have the exact script of this Mike Lindell. And I, hey, this is Mike Lindell. Right. These are dream sheets. They're made between the Sahara Desert the Mediterranean, and the Egyptian pyramids. So you know they're good. They're made of 322-count Egyptian cotton. I buy my geezer. They're made in Minnesota in a factory, so you know they're good. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Um, and also, right before I came on, I was, I was reading, I was listening to, I've been listening to Faith No More. Back and forth. I can't do a Faith No More voice on here. It'd be too embarrassing, but Falling to Pieces. That's a great song. Anyway, okay. So, uh, so okay, back to this lady, Mina Crandon. Okay, so what's the deal with her? You want me to just go into, uh, into the deal with her and about the, the assassination? By the way, his last words, his last words, I, I'm sorry, it keeps jumping frames. That's really annoying. His last words were, guess this thing is going to get me. And he had a premonition of his own death. Did you know that? Um, somebody put me together. Yeah, he had a premonition of his own death. He was in a car with his buddy, and he said, take me by this house. Took him by his house, and then he got out. He stood there in the rain, looked at the house, and he was started crying. And the guy came up to him and said, um, "What? what's the deal, short round? And he said, uh, I'm sad because this is the last time I'm ever going to look at this house. And then he died shortly thereafter. Um, he was, the whole stomach thing happened. But maybe that's because, as McGowan points out, um, there is something to deal, something, some deal going on with this Mina Crandon and her husband. So let me read about her husband. Um, and again, there's no way for us to know. We're never going to know this, but it is interesting in terms of the circumstances. So Crandon says, it says, Crandon was a year older than Houdini. He claimed descent from a score of signers of the Mayflower Pact. He had graduated from Harvard in 1894 and received his medical degree four years later. From 1903 to 1918, he was instructor in surgery at Harvard Medical School, leaving this post to serve in the First World War as a commander in the Medical Corps in the U.S. Navy. And he was a joiner, a member of, of both the British and American Societies for Psychical Research, the Harvard Club, the University Club, and the Boston Yacht Club. He was also the author of a well-known textbook on post-operative care and frequently contributed papers to scientific journals and symposia on psychic research. He was no cheap four-flusher to be kissed off lightly or frightened easily. 
While Houdini came up against Crandon, psychic believers asserted that the irresistible cannonball had met the immovable post. Um, his wife was of the greatest, uh, was probably the greatest American medium since uh, whoever this other person is. Um, and it says, this is interesting, on page 213 here, it says, gossip about the Crandons hinted at bizarre tastes and grotesque goings-on, both in and out of the seance room. But there's no way of confirming or denying such rumors now. Now, this is a straight-up biography, so they're not going to go into that. But I am going to go into it in something else that I read in a second. Um, also, when he died, it says, the funeral service. By the way, did you know Houdini died on Halloween Day? He died October 31st, uh, 1926. The funeral service was held in the Elks Clubhouse on 43rd Street in Manhattan. Beginning at 11 o'clock, the Elks Hour of Remembrance, a Masonic ceremony followed with a white lambskin laid across the coffin and the assembled Masons filing by, each dropping a bit of evergreen, symbol of everlasting life. At the close, an officer of the Society of American Magicians broke the ceremonial wand over the casket. Um, and then at his... To, at his graveside, there is a gigantic bust of him. Um, it is It's an elaborate tribute. He ought to know because Houdini designed it himself. And then later, of course, his wife became a, um, continued to be a, a famous medium. There was even a, uh, in like, I read an article about how in 1986, there was a seance in Chicago. All these, you know, tweaks and weirdos went to a seance where, they tried to contact Houdini in some creeper house. Um, this was in like the, uh, was it in the Chicago Tribune? And they ended up contacting Al Crowley instead. Anyway, um, Houdini and his wife did have a code word um, where uh, Houdini, one thing about Houdini is he always, made his friends and associates, he constantly made them take oaths, blood oaths, about never to reveal such and such a secret, right? And um, and he did have a code word with his wife about if one of them died first and came back from the dead. And the code word, the code word was um, related through a cipher. And later on, they figured out the cipher and the code word was believe. And she did go to a seance where she con she supposedly contacted her husband and was given that word and the medium had no idea. So, you know, who knows? Um, but the seances and all that, it's just, it's just a demonic ritual. They're just doing demonic rituals, contacting demons, right? Uh, Amtel says like a safe word. Have you heard, have you heard about the joke, the, the Norm MacDonald joke? Have I told this before? I'm getting... I'm getting uh, dementia, so I don't know. Uh, but Norm MacDonald, Norm MacDonald was on Conan. And he said, um, Conan asked him what he was in, what he was up to. And he said he was into the, um, Norm said he was into the S&M lifestyle, the community. He said it was a, it was a proud community. And he said, he said, he, he learned that the, uh, you know, when you first get into that community, they make you do the 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 M a lot more. But he wanted to do the S. It was way more sure it was way more fun. And then Conan said, Isn't that where they give you a safe word? And he said, Yeah, yeah. You want to hear my you want to hear my safe word? Boring. <laughs> Norm was definitely not into that in real life. But it's a good joke. Okay. Um yeah, so just a couple other things here. On page 138, it says Houdini could actually hold his breath for three minutes, and he seldom found a swimmer, no matter how distinguished who could beat him. That's okay, because I can hold my breath underwater for four minutes and 31 seconds. I've been training since I was little. Uh, master swimmer. So um, Houdini did also have an assistant. One of the things is that um, – a lot of these guys, they it's essential that they have a good assistant. You see this in all of the like all these famous guys and all the magic acts. And you you especially see it even in um in uh the prestige where he has Fallon, right? All that lard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, listen, what do they what do they um what do they tell you when you go to eat the chicken? Um 
you know, I order a bucket of chicken. What else do you order? Oh, don't make me say that thing. Now tell them what you order. Lard. I bring my own lard to the restaurant. It's got a, you know, it's got a purity to it, Norm says. <laughs> Shouts out to our homeboy Connor out there. Uh, but one, but Houdini did have this assistant named Jim Collins. Um, and Harry gained a new assistant, a man who soon became his chief aide on whom Houdini depended more and more as time proved his worth. This was an English mechanic and sandy reddish hair, a man of medium height and so, of so average a cast of countenance that he could pass in a crowd. He could have uh, made a uh, first class tail for any police department. His name was Jim Collins, Jim Collins. And he also had this other guy named Franz Kukol. Um, he had a bunch of people working for him who were absolutely devoted to him. And Jim Collins is interested, interesting because, you know, these guys kind of, they, they remind me of a Ronin, right? They, um, well, I guess not a Ronin cause that's a masterless servant, but these guys are like, they sort of exist as Ronin before they meet their, their magic master or whoever. But then for the rest of their life, they are absolutely devoted to these people. And in fact, if Jim Collins was still around, I think he died, but if he was around when the stomach punch thing happened, then of course that wouldn't have happened to Houdini, but that's neither here nor there. But you find that with a lot of these entertainers. I mean, you even find it when talking about Zeppelin, right? And Peter Grant and Richard Cole. And you find that, you know, get, get yourself, get yourself an absolutely devoted uh, best friend out there. Who's going to do anything for you. Never break your, never break the vault, never, un, you know, break your secrets, always going to be there no matter what, because these guys always seem to have that. Of course, he didn't have it in the end. I guess the guy was dead. But um, but we also have on page 51, I just want to go back to uh, there's a, there's another spiritual se seance, and this is the borderline between occult charlatanism and um, what the book says is honest magic, which means, of course, it's deviant magic. It's deviant. But it, in other words, it's the difference between the the actual magician and the who is who is also a charlatan, but but the the spiritualist seance charlatan who is going to offer to tell you the secrets, but then just fleece your wallet and you don't realize till you get home. Apparently, that happened back then a lot, um, and now I'm sure. The borderline between honest magic and occult charlatanism is a tenuous one at times. This says, and many a magician has crossed it when broke. Others have entered the twilight zone. Shouts out to Jerry. Twilight Zone of occult claims out of pure cynicism led to it by the refusal of 75% of any audience to regard mind reading feats as anything other than genuine telepathy and clairvoyance. In spite of the magician's disclaimers at the beginning of the show, everything I've done is done purely by natural means. I make no claim to supernormal power, whatever, whatsoever, which is what uh, Houdini constantly said. And he, in that sense, he was telling the truth. Right. He would tell the people, but see, but see, it's, it, it's then just as now they couldn't tell what was truth and what was lies because they were unable to decipher what was stage act and what was truth. In other words, he was telling them the truth. He's not going to perform some supernatural feat. He is, he is simply going to, um, escape from this milk jug, right. Or escape from the Chinese water torture cell or escape from the, you know, he's going to make himself disappear or whatever, but he wasn't really going to do that. But he did believe that this stuff was possible. Um, but he was exposing all the people that couldn't do it. Now, that goes back to this other guy that we're about to read about. Um, and hold on, let me get this out. This is. This is this guy who was the doctor and the husband of the blonde witch of Boston. Okay, so so first of all, um, let me start with an excerpt from The Secret Life of Houdini, the book. By the way, if you want to support me, please, um, you can click the super chat button down there. We got big things coming on the way, but for right now, um, please, uh, please, please, um, yeah, please uh, think about supporting me. Um, please think about uh, dropping some dropping some super chats, dropping some cash apps, and supporting me out there. Really appreciate you. Um, 
So this is a an excerpt from this is an excerpt from hold on a second from uh, exposing the secret life of Houdini, and this is a book that came out a few years ago by William Kalish and Larry Sloman, Secret Life of Houdini: The Making of America's First Superhero. And am I, is my audio still good? Am I good, y'all? Am I good? Hopefully, I'm still good. Hold on a second. Something up with my screen here. Let me move it over there. No, don't go over there. Okay. Uh, hold on, you guys. Sorry, Boomer Tekken for a second. Boomer Tekken. Now my chat's behind. That's weird. I don't know why I did that. Okay, all right. Sorry. No, go back, go back. There we go. Okay, all right. It says, let's see. Um, So he was born in Budapest, 1874. Um, Very young boy. He moved to Appleton, Wisconsin. Named after the French master Robert Houdin. Spelled H-O-U-D-I-N. The H was silent. Um, Let's see. They talk about the whole concept of the Superman says the whole concept of the Superman was generated between 1899 and 1919. That's the American Superman, not the Nietzschean Superman, even though that's what they're alluding to, so that's not really right. Um, It says, let's see, instead of resting on, let's see, the name Houdini was, was a synonym for escape and magic. Instead of resting on that, he decided what he would do is use his money, skills, fame, and devote himself and be an advocate for the public good in a specific field, which was against the fraudulent spiritualists. That's also not really correct because I wrote, I understand this is conversational, but this is kind of a missequencing and it seems to confuse the reader further. Um, okay. So when he got to England, it's, this is the, this is the interesting part. Uh, what he needed was money. Um, the interviewer here says, what you also write in the book is that he was a friend and perhaps a secret agent for the American British governments, American and British governments, because he was very famous before World War I. Um, Houdini spoke German, but then you put him in England. He goes to London and befriends the head of Scotland Yard's special branch, a man named William Melville, and impresses him with this ability to, uh, to get out of manacles. The author says, that's right. He meets Melville. It's very interesting that – Here's somebody who's unknown in England, and he meets one of the most important police officers in all of England, uh, all of Great Britain at the time, William Melville, who's in charge of foreign intelligence for Great Britain. And he immediately gets an endorsement from Melville, which is enormous, and starts to succeed and is sent or decides to go to Germany, another place he's unknown. And what we found was that Houdini was sending back information about what we saw in Ger- what he saw in Germany. And in 1908, the last entry we have from Houdini, Houdini had a special sort of military exercise or carnival that the Kaiser would put on. And we believe he was there looking at very early aircraft that were being developed for warfare in Germany. It's pretty interesting because Houdini was interested in aircraft. Shouts out to Amptown One, who, who super chats two bucks, says – Thinking about supporting you. Thank you so much for thinking about supporting me, and thank you for supporting me. Really appreciate that. Um, and we know that Houdini was interested in aircraft because, again, he went to Australia, and he was first in flight in Australia. Pretty interesting, without crashing. Uh, Pim Sims says, you seem to be a well-traveled man. What are some cool spots you have been? Thanks for the stream. Good topic. I'm going to answer these as I go so I don't get, I don't get behind in the Super Chats. Because I'm afraid with this new system I have up, I won't be able to go back to it. So I'm just going to answer these now. Um, some cool spots that I've been to. Um, I've been to many, many cool spots. It depends what you mean by um, what you mean by cool spots. I mean, I think I think that there are different kinds of cool spots. I would say, obviously, I mean that's a good question. I I would say that. Um, my favorite, my favorite place uh, in the world is in Northern Ireland. Well, either my favorite places are here, where I grew up, here in VA, or um, in parts of uh, Mississippi. But also, very a place that's very special to me is um, is the North Coast in Northern Ireland, and Ulster, um, especially uh, the little island when you walk out the Carrickareed Rope Bridge or Sheep Island in Northern Ireland. The most 
beautiful spot. Uh, the most beautiful spots I've ever been to in terms of nature would be that Switzerland, uh, the Schwarzwald, the Black Forest in Germany, um, parts of Spain. I would say walking across, I walked across, uh, I walked through the Lake District in January. That was January 21 years, 22 years ago. 22 years, yeah, 22 years ago. I was walk this time I was walking across the uh, Lake District in um, in England. I walked through Cumbria, um, down to Windermere and Ambleside along the along Hadrian's Wall by myself. That was amazing. Um, it's it's putting it lightly to say it was amazing. It was one of the most significant things in my life. Um, and uh, where else? Um, when I, I walked across, uh, Denmark is beautiful. I walked across um, Liechtenstein from um, Switzerland to Austria, right across the whole country. I mean, it's only five miles wide, but I walked across the border. That was right after the the EU sort of went into effect and they got rid of the borders and you could just do that. Uh, the um, cool, I think the coolest city I've ever been to in terms of like, in terms of, I've been to a lot of cities, but I think that the most amazing city I've probably ever been to is Hong Kong. Hong Kong is like, is like, it's like uh, colonial English juxtaposed against Blade Runner futurism. It's like Mirror City with neon. It it's like the buildings look like Robo praying mantis. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's like so unbelievable. New York City. I lived in New York City for a year, so that was cool. Um, but you said I never explored West Virginia. Yeah, I ain't talking West Virginia. I'm talking Virginia, Virginia. Shouts out to you if you live in West Virginia. West Virginia is beautiful, but I'm um, talking about the, you know, if you can ever go to the Skyline Drive or Blue Ridge Mountains or Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. So, um, yeah, I've been to Hong Kong, Singapore. Uh, Thailand. I lived in Malaysia for a summer. Uh, uh, stopped in Taiwan. Been to Honduras is amazing. Costa Rica is amazing. Been to Mexico twice. Uh, Bahamas. Um, Ireland, Scotland, England, France, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Denmark, Spain, Portugal. Um, Italy, been to Italy twice. Italy, Greece, Turkey. Uh, been a, been a, been a bunch of places. Good question. Okay, so yeah, keep keep uh, dropping me the super chats or support me directly if you want via Cash App, PayPal, Venmo. I really appreciate that. It gets right to me, and I can buy books. So I really appreciate y'all, and I really appreciate you. Anyway, you support me, um, sharing the stream, just sharing the stream, liking the stream, leaving a comment after the stream. I really, I really appreciate that. Those are amazing and really special to me. So thank you. Um, so let's see. Um, this, the interviewer says, now could you describe, please describe, I think we should get to at least some of these amazing escape acts that Houdini was prim primarily known for. And about choosing the Siberian transport cell, which brought him eventually to the attention of Tsar Nicholas. What was Cy what was the Siberian transport cell? Well, this guy says, they had a horse-drawn carriage that was, and its whole purpose was to put prisoners and primarily political prisoners in. They locked the door in Moscow, and then it would take its, I think it was a 27-day or something trip to Siberia with no heat. Um, it was never opened the entire way. They had to sluice the thing out when it got there. Uh, it was never heated and uh, was never opened the entire way. Uh, the horse-drawn carriage was aligned with metal. It had never been escaped from, and of course, it was really a fearsome device, and it's an amazing escape where they really strip-searched him. They did. They, they body cavity searched him. They're brutal. They look at every possible place you can imagine from any sort of device, and then they chain him into this, this inescapable box. And we backtracked using techniques that Houdini had talked about later in his life about how to get out of various things. When we put together what we believe is the explanation of how he escaped from this treacherous device, which this guy says you conjecture is a false finger story. Well, we know that Houdini used false fingers because he talks about it later. And we know because Houdini kept an extensive diary. He kept an extensive diary. And also Houdini, um, I meant to say earlier in the stream, was was adamant about the fact that it was okay to and sometimes reveal 
secrets of escapes because he said the whole idea of how he became who he was was built on competition. A lot of this competition was competition with himself because nobody could match him. But he said basically – the thing that haunted him, again, was the specter of oblivion. So what would happen basically is that you would do a magic act and then somebody would come along and would do it better. And that constantly meant that you were on the brink of total uh, you know, abandonment from the public and oblivion as a performer. You know, you see celebs do that today. I mean, that's that's a, that that in a lot of ways is what celebs are afraid of is this kind of oblivion because because of the self centeredness and ego uh, centrism. And but what Houdini said was that this engendered a kind of uh, drive for perfection in terms of doing something bigger and better and. Remember, Houdini kept working until until his death. I mean, he was in his 50s when he died. And he found that he was stronger in his 50s. And he wasn't just bragging. He wasn't just bragging about this, folks. I mean, he had a, he had a, he was, he was, as actors say, he was in tune with his body instrument. Um, so he knew what he was capable of and he knew his limits. And he was about complete and total um control of all of his acts. But um, but you know, revealing secrets sometimes or other people discovering your, his secrets would only lead him to go further. But obviously the secrecy element plays into the, the, this entire book that these two guys have written on his espionage activities. It says, um, well, Houdini used false fingers because he talks about it later. And we know about the use of what's called a gili saw, which is a little serrated piece of wire that could, it's strong enough to, in fact, surgeons invented, invented it to cut through the human skull. And some, something like that was hidden in a finger and possibly something like a sort of can opener that could cut through zinc. And that's how we conjecture that it happened. But he did write about this. And it's in, it's in the book we were just reading from. It's also possible that he bribed his way out, but I think it's not romantic enough. I think he probably actually escaped it the honest way, so to speak, which is the honest, the sort of honest dishonesty. Now, that the whole bribing his way out comes from, in the book, they talk about how when the Russians found out that he escaped from this, um, from this carriage, prison carriage, they said, well, we know how he got out. It's the simplest way to get out of any Russian prison cell, which is you bribe the guard because prison is only as strong as its as its uh, weakest guard, right? But because this was being observed and this was a kind of a public activity, the it was it was part of the act. The showmanship was part of the act. He had to show people that he got out. It wasn't just a bribe. Otherwise, of course, he could have just bribed his way out. This guy says, you write that intelligence services sir, and this is from this article's from NPR, uh, 2006. Uh, so it's a mainstream article. Um, you write that intelligence services, certainly British intelligence services anyway, use some of these kinds of devices in the Secret Service in England. That's right. James Bond, the guy says. Well, actually, you know, now that you mentioned James Bond, we'll go back to William Melville briefly. Briefly, This William Melville that we say recruited Houdini retired in 1903, and they have his diary. And was supposedly until the 1990s, it was thought that he just actually retired. And now we know he didn't just retire. He actually went on to start MI5. And he was the handler for Sidney Riley, who was, a lot of people believe, is the template for James Bond. Um, Melville is also the guy who supposedly had a contact or was a handler or attempted handler for Al Crowley. Um, this says, why do so many people believe that uh, Houdini died in 1926 during one of his own escape acts. And he says that's because of the Tony Curtis movie with Janet Lee, his wife, in the 1950s. So it's sort of a misdirection. And then this says, well, the true story has always been that he was punched in the abdomen while relaxing in Montreal. And a little over a week later, he dies of a ruptured appendix in Detroit. Uh, he did a speaking engagement at, at McGill University shortly after that, doing a debunking um, speech which may have also been part of, I'm getting to what actually may have caused this. Um, it says, so we started speaking with doctors and we found that it's not possible really that you could be punched and cause, and it causes appendicitis. And we found that before this incident had been, 
he had been sick by something he'd eaten, and his wife had been sick as well. We looked at the idea that many of the spiritualists had debunked that were predicting his death, were really angry about what he was doing to the fraudulent spiritualist movement. Then we hit the gold mine. We contacted his biggest nemesis at the time, Marjorie, the medium whom he debunked. Her great-granddaughter, I think she's in her 30s, and we asked if she still had any of the papers, anything like that. And she said, well, yeah, I have all the papers. And we found a whole new story, a story about Marjorie's husband, the, Har the Harvard-trained surgeon who really, really despised Houdini. That's the guy we were just talking about, Ler Leroy. He was an expert in appendectomies. In fact, his nickname was Belly Button Crandon because he invented a surgery that went in through the navel instead of through the side. And this guy was, this guy, here we go. This guy was adopting, he was adopting mm, from England um, and they're disappearing. In, order, in other words, this guy was a creeper who was adopting, he was doing adoptions and all of the ad adoptions were disappearing. And Houdini, had somehow found out about this. He informed the Secret Service of the United States. So all of these players are involved and they're predicting Houdini's death. And then all of a sudden he gets very sick and dies on Halloween, 1926. This guy says, so you can't prove it, but perhaps it was the poison pill in the library with the butler. It's possible. And that's what these two guys came up with in their book. In other words, their speculation is that Houdini died because he had found out about the creeper activities tied in with the person that he debunked and was offed because of it, which is sort of the same thing that we've seen with Cobain and a bunch of people, right? Um, this says, let's see, here's another one. Um, this is from... This one's about Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, this is about the medium and the magician. Um, there was a movie called Death Defying Acts, which I haven't seen. It's a Guy Pierce, but I like Guy Pierce, but it's Guy Pierce and Catherine Zeta Jones. I'm not gonna watch a I'm not gonna watch a Houdini movie about Houdini, though, because I I I feel like they're all gonna be disappointing in terms of my own perception. Um if I can figure out how to why this is not working. Hold on, give me one second, you guys. I'm sorry. I don't know why this is not working. Oh. That's why. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, that's weird. Okay, anyway, sorry. Sorry. Okay, so this says, um, this is from the medium and the ma uh, magician. In 1924, Houdini set out to expose a medium named Mina Crandon, again, the Marjorie, who used the name Marjorie. Marjorie wasn't Scottish. She was Canadian who lived in Boston with her physician husband. The prize money was... $2,500 put up by Scientific American to anyone who could prove that they had psychic powers. The judges were Walter Franklin Pierce, an American psychical researcher, Hereward Carrington, an occult writer, Daniel Comstock, who introduced Technicolor to film, and William McDougall, a professor of psychology at Harvard University. Uh, in 1924, Houdini was a world-famous magician, and he'd even dabbled in the medium of film. Um... Yeah, he even dabbled in the medium of film. But his newest passion was debunking mediums. It wasn't that Houdini wasn't open to the idea of being able to contact the spirit world. There had been moments in his life that he couldn't explain. Once in Berlin, Houdini was put in a box, tied up and handcuffed so tightly that he wasn't sure he was going to be able to get it out. His wife, Bess, had prayed to Houdini's late father for help. Before he died, he told Houdini that if he ever needed help, he would be there. Within seconds after Bess's prayer, Houdini was able to escape the handcuffs. On another occasion... Houdini had seen a fleeting vision of his mother, and the next day he learned she'd passed away. What's interesting also about Houdini is that they discovered when he died that he had been giving away tons of his money. He'd been supporting, obviously, all the people in his business that had been helping him, all of his assistants, but he had like a dozen people on lifelong pensions, even, even strangers. Um, spiritualism had been on the rise Again, both in America and in Europe and in the aftermath of World War I, noted author and creator of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, was a firm believer. It seems hard to understand how Conan Doyle, the man who created one of the most rational men alive, could be so, become so convinced that spirits, spirits exist, says this author. Well, because he was interested in the occult. Maybe sometime we should do, we should do um, 
Arthur Conan Doyle's The Sign of Four, which is often seen as the best uh, the best uh, Sherlock Holmes book. Maybe we should do that in the future. Um, he had come to spiritualism gradually over the years. After the death of his son Kingsley in the First World War, he threw his lot in with spiritualism wholeheartedly because he wanted an easy way. He wanted to be able to do necromancy and and go to occult magic rituals and to contact demons on the other side, thinking that they were his son. However, like a lot of converts, he had a one-track mind when it came to spiritualism. He was unable to see anyone else's point of view. He said, I consider the psychic question to be infinitely the most important thing in the world. All modern inventions and discoveries will sink into insignificance besides those psychic facts, which will force themselves within within a... Uh, that cuts so within a few years upon the universal human mind. Uh, Conan Doyle was also in the circles with H.G. Wells, remember? Conan Doyle and Houdini became friends when Houdini came to England to perform. While he was there, he hoped to have Conan Doyle introduce him to various mediums who might have been reluctant to meet him, given his position on spiritualism. As the two men got to know each other over the next few years, Conan Doyle became convinced that Houdini's gifts were psychic in nature and not a carefully planned and rehearsed act, despite Houdini's protestations to the contrary. He wrote Houdini telling him he didn't need to go to search for creditable medium when he was already one. I know I've already gone over this in the stream, but I just thought I would read from the, some of the source material here. So forgive me if I'm just reading to you, but I'm reading from the material that I found. So, and we're not just doing like a Wikipedia articles where I'm trying to read from some very, some, some various sources, especially mainstream sources. Um, Houdini even sent him a copy of his book, Miracle Mongers and Their Methods, where he exposed the secrets of the sword swallowers, snake charmers, and other sh sideshow entertainers. Um, they used, uh, of course, when they contacted Houdini's mother, supposedly, they used automatic writing to do so, and it produced those weird results that we said before where it was in English, and of course his mother didn't speak English, so Houdini was not impressed, and then that's when they fell out. Okay, here's Mina Crandon. At first glance, Mina Crandon seemed an unlikely medium. She seems an exceedingly attractive woman who came across more like a lighthearted flapper than most of the, during the jazz age, than most mediums who seem solid and serious. Mina was the daughter of a Canadian farmer who had moved to Boston as a teenager to play in various dance bands. When that didn't work out, Mina, through a series, through a series of odd jobs, including secretary, actress, and ambulance driver, after divorcing her husband, by whom she had a son, Mina married Dr. Leroy Goddard Brandon, twice married, and a former instructor of surgery at Harvard Medical School in 1918. Um, Mina had met Crandon when she was admitted to the hospital, probably for an appendectomy. And again, this guy was famous for, um, creating the method. Uh, yes, no, slow boy. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kristen. Yeah, that is what she spoke. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he created the method for, uh, the, the, append the appendectomy through the navel. Um, Surprise, surprise, it turned out to be me. Let's see, ironically, just a few days before, a psychic had told me that she possessed supernatural abilities that she sensed that a laughing man was trying to contact her from beyond the grave. The young man turned out to be Mina's late brother, Walter, who died in a railroad accident in 1911, a demon. Walter would turn out to be Mina's spirit guide, a quick-witted fellow who loved to use foul language. Mina was so versatile, versatile that Walter would continue talking even when she appeared to be snoring or holding water in her mouth. Um, during the seances, mysterious things would happen. Bumps and raps rang out and strange flashes of light pierced the darkness. Once a live pigeon appeared in the room, um, convinced of her talents, Dr. Cranon took Mina abroad where she made the acquaintance of Arthur Conan Doyle, who was convinced that Mina was the real enchilada. He declared that she was a very powerful medium and that her gifts were beyond all question. Of course, uh, I also didn't say that Houdini invented a medium proof device, which was like this box where, cause he learned, you know, he, he, he perfected the, the, uh, gate back from the box and the, uh, the crib escape, the milk jug escape, the water torture device escape, the safe escape and all this stuff. But he himself built and manufactured a medium proof, so he called it device, which is basically a box where you would put the woman inside it and only her her head and her hands would stick out and her feet were supposed to be inside the box. Um, and he found it because he found a bunch of people when he was debunking them uh, that 
that um, they would, you know, their their legs would be either would have some sort of electrical instrument tied to it, or they would be they would receive a. There was a guy sitting in the other room that would, you know, tap in a message to them, um, kind of like that scene in Casino. So he was always exposing this sort of thing. So, but that's of course because again, who did he wanted to find the real thing? Uh, what did what did Cobain find? Well, supposedly, he found the same thing um, that Houdini found with these creepers, and that uh, his wife was uh, kind of a G Max character for these people. Um, the the person about that, um, Slo- um, Kristen posted, Slow Boy Whiteboard posted some stuff about that. Um, not not too long ago. So I would come through the archives of her channel because she's got some good material about that. And, you know, who knows, but mm, seems, seems, seems to be the case with a lot of these um, mysterious things. In fact, I, 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 there was the recent revelation where uh, Cobain was talking about that, where he had found out about certain creeper activities. So um, I think that that's probably likely. Uh, anyway. Um, this says, Mina's first real test came in late 1923 in front of a group of Harvard professors and students. When it was over, one of the participants, William McDougall, tried to get Mina to admit she was a fraud. The Scientific American contest was going to be her crowning achievement as a medium. In other words, these, put, these people were putting up money to try and debunk her. Um, and let's see. Um, not only had the committee availed themselves of the Crandon's hospita- hospitality, but one of the investigators had borrowed money from Dr. Crandon, of course. Um, she'd moved on. It's, this says, Mina continued to give seances. Mina had moved on from just channeling Walter. She was now able to produce physical evidence such as ectoplasm from various body parts. Nasty. Um, here's, here's the device. Here's the, if you can see that, here's the Houdini anti-medium device. This person's stuck in the box. Somebody owns all this stuff now. He willed all of it. Somebody owns that device now. Um, but now let's get to the real meat and potatoes of the latter part of this uh, little stream, which is our boy, Nate. Let's start it out. Uh, our, our boy, Dave McGowan, who writes in... Um, weird scenes inside the canyon. Weird scenes inside the gold mine. He writes in this. Um, let's see. He's talking about the Grim Game. Grim Game, one of Houdini's films. What struck both of us, um, this is from the Grim Game, the book. Uh, what struck both of us was that there were huge gaps in Houdini's life story and some puzzling inconsistencies. So in, this is the two authors who wrote about discovering the real Houdini. Um, so we embarked on a journey to discover the real man. Early on, we discovered an important connection that most biographers seem to miss. This is from the introduction of the secret life of Houdini. Um, they talk about the Laurel Canyon house and the Houdini house. There's considerable debate, considerable debate over the question of whether Harry Houdini ever lived in Laurel Canyon in the house that was later owned by Errol Flynn. Um, but then it goes on to say, let's see. Um, he okay, so he sailed from from America to England after he'd made some money. He moved. He sailed on to England for his career, and they say this would be career suicide in those days because nobody moved, nobody knew him. Now, I would disagree with that's kind of oversimplification. I mean, he was. This is a sort of an international trade, and of course, the audiences. W- one thing that the other book points out is that the audiences were much more receptive to these kinds of vaudeville magic acts than they were in America, especially outside of New York, because they were a less um, critical audience uh, in terms of like, for instance, with tabloids, they were willing to believe anything that they read in the newspapers. And so that, so that sort of makes sense. Um, but Houdini went first to England and then Scotland, Holland, and then Germany. When he went to Germany, he was immediately suspect because he had just come from England. And at the time there was a lot of uh, national animosity uh, this is pre-World War England. And then, um, and then of course, he went on to Russia where there was a, a natural suspicion of Americans, of Americans. And he was lauded by the press in France and Russia, but he was able to do all this really quickly and easily, um, even as a not very well-known performer. 
which is where part of the speculation comes into play. Um, he, let's see, for the last few years leading up to his death on October 31st, 1926, Houdini primarily focused on debunking psychics and mediums, leading some to speculate that the spiritualist movement may have been um, behind his untimely demise. To this day, seances are regularly held around the world in attempts to contact the famed magician and escape artist. Um, yeah, people continue to have these weird seances to try and um, to try and uh, to try and contact Houdini himself. Why is this doing this? So weird. Give me one second here, y'all. I keep having problems with the video here. Give me one second. Um, so talk amongst yourselves. Talk amongst yourselves. All right, there we go. Okay, so McGowan. So McGowan says, there are indications that the practice of using entertainers to carry out covert operations dates back to well before the 1860s. If researchers Graham Phillips and Martin Keenan are to be to believe the most acclaimed entertainment figure of all time, here we go. The poet, playwright, actor William Shakespeare was part of aspiring, serving under Sir Francis Wals Walsingham, head of the Elizabethan Secret Service. Now, he was part of the ring of people. Uh, maybe he was, but but um, I've never read anything that said that Shakespeare was part of the spy ring. He was part of the ring that had spies in it because Marlowe was part of the spy ring operated by Francis Walsh. I mean, I mean it's, it, there's no proof. There's no way to know, but it, um, I've always accepted the fact that Kit Marlowe was assassinated in the tavern brawl. That's why, why he was stabbed in the eye when he was 31 in the tavern brawl, so-called tavern brawl, because Marlowe was most likely a spy working under Walsingham, and Marlowe and Shakespeare were known with each other, but whatever. So, too, were Christopher Marlowe and various other of uh, Shakespeare's contemporaries. Um, who else? Um, not Philip Sidney, but uh, Edmund Spencer. Um. They had, but this this is, makes a good case. They had perfect cover, traveling widely and widely, and receiving welcome everywhere. And since many were also actors, um, role playing was often second nature. Many knew foreign languages. Furthermore, as the usual social barriers were often dropped for poets, they were equally at home in backstreet pubs or in the palaces of the mighty. They were thus in the privileged position of having their eyes and ears everywhere. That's true. I mean, how much is, like, Jay is talking about this, right, so much. I mean, wrote two books on it, right, and just did another stream on the fact that, you know, the, the on sparrows and ravens and how there have been many cases of famous actors, uh, celebrities, and models used as spies just in the, just in the, Western world and just in the modern era. But this isn't new. It's not a new phenomenon. And although Houdini, you know, sort of precedes all those in terms of the modern, I mean, he's right at the cusp of the Victorian and the modern era. There's no reason why it would be any different. In fact, look at his career. But again, there's no way to know except for this diary by William, William Melville, which seems to confirm this. But who knows? Even that, I don't even know if that could be, if that could be, um, that also could be fake because the all everything about Houdini's life is like up for speculation because that's the way that he wanted it. This says, um, it appears then the practice of utilizing entertainers for covert operator operations didn't begin with Wilkie. Uh, Wilkie was this guy that was Houdini's contact in Chicago and that ended up being investigated and I think he was convicted by Secret Service. Later on, um, I'll get to that part. Houdini's um, covert backers were Senator Chauncey Depew, an uncle of magician Ganson Depew, and a former mentor to then Vice President Theodore Roosevelt, who would be catapulted into the presidency by the assassination of William McKinley, one of the final victims of the decade. Uh, Houdini soon gained another hidden backer, William Melville, the head of Scotland Yard's special branch and the most visible law enforcement official in the UK. It's from Dave McGowan. Um, Melville would ultimately become the first chief of Britain's MI5, assuming essentially the same position filled more than three centuries, centuries earlier by Walsingham. 
Within days of arriving in England, Houdini met with a prominent Scotland Yard inspector, and once again, his career took off. The inspector was Melville, whom Houdini secretly met with on June 14, 1900, five days after arriving on English shores. He left the U.S. on May 30th using a passport issued just two days earlier, a passport that contained more than its fair share of anomalies. The doc, uh, Okay, so the document listed his birthday as April 6th, even though it is said that his birthday was March 24th, but that's... That's a little iffy because he didn't. He was four when he came over, and then the records got lost at Ellis Island, so we don't know when his actual birthday was. So that's that's all right. But there were other things. Given his background as both a magician and a mason by his own account, it goes without saying that secrecy, deception, and illusion were second nature to Houdini. He was also able to interact with the country's police officials and do demonstrations inside their jails, and he was known to be rather proficient at the art of breaking and entering. That was his whole career, right? Needless to say, these abilities would have served Houdini well in the world of espionage. Um, a friend of Houdini's fellow magician, Billy Robinson, was also well-versed in the tradecraft of the intelligence community. Um, in addition to possessing skills and knowledge that were ideally suited to the spook trade, Houdini also ran what could best be described as his own personal spy ring because... Because he did. He had a bunch of people working for him spying on his counterparts and his competition. Y'all, hit smash that like. If you haven't smashed that like, please try to smash that like. Share the stream. Thank you for being here so much. Um, hope y'all are enjoying some of this esoterica about Houdini, of all people. But again, I find this relevant because of all the stuff that's it's in the spirit of the age, right? The zeitgeist. This is one of the points of the channel. Even though this isn't pure literary analysis, we are reading some literature by our boy Dave McGowan and, of course, that book by book on Houdini that I picked up for four bucks at the old bookshop by the guy who wrote Nightmare Alley. So it's interesting. Pim says Avatar 2 sucks. Yeah, no kidding. Um, thank you for smashing that like. Really appreciate y'all. Um, we're, co we're coming back again. We're coming back with some pure literary analysis uh, for the pretty much for the rest of the month and some, some film analysis. But I just thought this would be a kind of a good sidestep into biography and talking about it. Houdini just interests me on the surface. Um, let's see. Uh, with his espionage, tradecraft, and dubious passport in tow, Houdini traveled to Germany in September 1900 after taking the British Isles by storm. Um, okay. This says, I'm going to skip ahead here, some of the meaty parts. Um, in December 1914, just a few months after the provocation that allegedly triggered World War I, Houdini was summoned to the nation's capital for a private audience with then-President Woodrow Wilson. It is anyone's guess, McGowan says, what business the two men discussed, but it probably had little to do with stage tricks. Although there is a film, the film is being made right now, it's in production with um, uh, Benedict uh, Cumberbatch dealing with the other magician in World War II, the guy who What's the guy's name who was hired by MI6 to conceal the coastal uh, artillery battery and then um, and he used mirrors to form the illusion that the city was on another part of the coast than it was, so the Germans bombed the wrong thing. I forget the guy's name, but he was an actual magician that they hired. And we're, and that's, you know, we're not just, that we're talking here just straight up, you know, illusionist. We're not even talking magician, occult magician like we are with, I mean, yes, the two things coincide. I realize that, but we're not talking occult magician like, like with Aleister Crowley and Dennis Wheatley and, um, and Hess. But this is interesting because, because, um, this says, uh, let's see, certainly the real consultant for the project, it later says, is said to have been a cultist intelligence asset, Aleister Crowley. Um. Uh, let's see, 100,000 people. Did you know that April 20th, later on, the birth of that, that guy, right, with the angry mustache. But in April 20th of 1914, it says an estimated 100,000 people gathered in Washington, D.C. to watch Houdini perform a straitjacket escape. 100,000 people. Did y'all know that? And one year later, April 19, okay, that was 1916. In April 1917, the U.S. declared war on Germany. Um, I mean, Houdini also, whether or not he was a 
uh, you know, who he was spying for and who he was, you know, who he was spying for. Two of the things that certainly caused animosity or caused the target to be put on his back, besides his lifelong rivalry with all these people and his debunking of spiritualists, was um, his congressional testimony, right, which is a whole different sort of arena than his usual activities. And then also his, um, his war bonds. He sold uh, an astronomical amount in war bonds during World War I. Um, now, I'm not saying that would cause animosity for, for Houdini. I'm not saying that. What, what I mean, what I, you, know, you know what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that that makes him a very public figure in terms of activities during wartime, right? Where he's going uh, across international lines and, and international boundaries, and yet he's doing these big things. Um, okay, so here we go. Marjorie Mina Stinson, Canada, 1888. Oh, born in 1888, same year as... Uh, one day people will look back and say, I gave birth to the 20th century, right? Our Jack the Ripper stream. I'd moved with her family to Boston, Massachusetts in 1917. The then married Mina was hospitalized and operated on by Dr. Leroy Goddard Crandon, uh, a man who occupied a prestigious position in Boston society. Crandon was a direct descendant of one of the original 23 Mayflower passengers and a member of the Boston Yacht Club. He had graduated from Harvard Medical School and also obtained a master's degree in philosophy from Harvard, where he also served as an instructor. Just before meeting Mina, he had served as a naval officer and as head of the surgical staff at U.S. Naval Hospital during World War I. Um, they had an inner circle, and one of the fellows was by the name Joseph uh, Dukov, a wealthy steel tycoon born in Poland, educated in England and Tsarist Russia before settling in America to practice law. He was jailed in Boston on embezzlement charges, later fleeing to Chicago after embezzling yet more money. He soon turned up in, of all places, Savannah, Cuba, where, according to the two authors, in 1898, he was recruited by John Wilkie, the Secret Service chief, as a co-optee and was involved in spying for the U.S. during the Spanish-American War. This would be, needless to say, the very same John Wilkie who had kickstarted Harry Houdini's career that very same year. As a reward for his service, Jukov had a history of violence, was given the contract to salvage the battleship Maine in the Havana Harbor. The main had been sunk in what appears to have been a fake flag operation carried out by U.S. intel operatives to justify launching a bloody colonial war. Although fragmentary, there's clear evidence that Leroy and Mina Cranon, in conjunction with Jukov and various others, began sometime soon after getting married to adopt an untold number on, to ad make a large number of adoptions who subsequently went missing. Um... In one surviving letter sent on August 4th, 1925, Crandon notes that about December 1st, I had Mr. Jukov bring over a uh, small person from a London home from possible for possible adoption. In April 1925, our Secret Service Department at Washington received a letter saying that I had first and last 16 of these keys in my house for ostensible adoption, and they had all disappeared. Four years earlier, a Boston newspaper had reported that they had been rescued from a raft. That one, the two, the two of them had been rescued from a raft. One, who was eight, was her son from a previous marriage, and the other was an adoptee. Was reportedly so unhappy at the Cranon home that he was frantically attempting an escape with the younger boy in tow. Two years later, when Marjorie began her mediumship, there was no trace of them in the household. Perhaps he was homeless. Or perhaps he was the body who was found on the outskirts of Joseph Jukov's large estate in Ramsey, New Jersey during that time period. Um, the, Crandon was being sued for $40,000 for operating on a woman for cancer when she was simply pregnant and dis, dis, and killing the... Mm, a highly incredible story which persists is that uh Someone disappeared mysteriously, claims that he's now in a home in England, but it's been going on for years and no one can answer it. Okay, in response to questions raised about the disappearance of one particular um, young person, um, 
Mina complained that people wrote asking about his whereabouts and the prime minister of England cabled to ask where he was and demanded a cable reply. Why people, why people even said that Dr. Crandon committed illegal operations on little and hilt them. According to Marjorie K I L T, uh, the poor little, okay. I can't read the rest of this. On one occasion, Marjorie opened a closet in her home and showed guests a collection of a number of creeper photographs, like a huge number of them. And um, then it says they were being investigated by John Wilkie's Secret Service and British MP by the name of Harry Day. Houdini had an extensive library of literature in the occult, began working with horror writer and occultist H.P. Lovecraft. Um, and then they started investigating this. Apparently, they started investigating. They were asked to investigate the veracity of this uh, on the orders of either this John Wilkie guy or somebody in Secret Service. And then that in conjunction with the that in conjunction with the debunking activity is what caused the lead up to the punch in the stomach and the poisoning event. So I think that's a it's a lot of circumstantial stuff. And I mean, Houdini did know a lot of people. All these guys are famous and rich, but Houdini also is on another level than obviously these elite people. But but um, but he knew them and moved within their circles, and I would suspect that that is probably probably what happened. If if what happened wasn't exactly as we're told it happened with the punch in the stomach and then the the uh, appendicitis, it is very weird that the guy who had it out for him the most was an appendicitis doctor, and that guy ended up being his doctor when his stomach was ruptured. And then, and that guy hates him the most. And then that guy is, is his doctor. And he had just, you know, he just gone through this poisoning. So maybe that's what ended up happening to Houdini. And, and maybe he was involved in these espionage activities. Then again, I mean, and that would make sense, but, but who knows, right? Because it's impossible to know because again, the whole thing about Houdini's life is about illusion and misdirection. And that's, that's like his whole thing. Right. And there were people that were in on his circle, but that's his whole, that's his whole celeb, right? That's his whole. And it's interesting that it's also interesting just as a commentary that the, the first guy that's called a Superman in America is this is Houdini. So he's sort of supposed to typify the, not the Nietzschean Superman, but like this American version of like a Superman, uh, almost comic book-like character. Of course, then he gets into film and Hollywood. We barely even covered his Hollywood activities. Uh, Houdini found also that, like, he wasn't that successful in, in Hollywood because um, his whole activity was like, his whole shtick, his whole entertainment was a live audience, right? Which is different from film. And, and they found, he found that the directors of his, I mean, he had a production company, but they found that the directors of his films would keep trying to get him to act. And he just couldn't, act. they would just give up also because he was too conservative. Apparently like he, the love interest in his movies, he didn't want to kiss the love interest because he was married to Bess. And so he would do everything he could to get out of it. He was too, he was too conservative with that. So he wanted to get out of it. So it, the movies didn't work. Um, but, uh, but it just is interesting that, um, that, you know, that that's how it ended with him and that who knows, it could be exactly as we're told, of course, even, even being told what we're told, I mean, everybody like 60 years ago, according to these books and according to the, the film of Houdini with Tony Curtis thought that he died during one of his stunts. So even that was sort of not whitewashed, but enter entertainmentized, right? So it's like whenever, when you, when you don't know anything about the guy and even he doesn't know his own birthday and then he, he is constantly seeding the media with like false stories about himself. Cause he wants to control that. He absolutely controlled the publicity about himself. That was part of it. 
um, it's hard to tell what's real and what's not. So anyway, but for all that, it is interesting just to, you know, anybody can speculate on any of these people, but I think that we, our, our job is just to go back to the source material and go back to some of the literature about it. And that's what we've done. Um, so anyway, that's about all I got you guys, uh, for Rudini. Um, I thought that was a kind of, again, like an interesting little sidestep into something that is, seems to be pure entertainment, but ends up again, having, um, horrible occult creeper and Intel ties as this stuff always seems to do, not always, but seems to do. Um, so the rest of the week I'll be going into, um, I'll shortly, you know, in a couple of days, I guess I'll be streaming. i um, talking about Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf. This is a great book. Um, this is like, I, I read this in 2000. And it's a it's a book that really appeals, you know, to you, especially in your youth. Um, and I'm rereading it now. So we'll be covering Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse. Then we'll be doing uh, again. We'll be doing Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. We'll be talking about Chaz Manson. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, Richard Hughes, High Wind in Jamaica. Some more Faulkner. We'll be doing um, Graham Greene's Power and the Glory. We'll be doing. Um, what else? We'll be doing uh, a stream just on Wes Anderson Films, which was a, a sponsored stream. We'll be doing a streetcar named Desire um, and the Glass Menagerie. Shouts out to Toledo for sponsoring that stream. We'll be doing Prestige and the Prestige book. It's a '90s book. <laughs> Kristen says Hensley. I can't wait to go back to the beginning. Very interesting topic. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. <laughs> so. If you didn't, if you've enjoyed this, um, this stream and you're watching, please, um, yeah, give me a, give me a shout out by leaving a comment afterwards. Really appreciate that. Um, leave a comment below. Let's see. Shouts out to Sasha for that $10, uh, PayPal. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much for supporting me. That really helps me out. Well, we're all working. I went to the gas station today and the, and the, the, the petrol was back up over three dollars, three twenty nine. What in the world, dude? <laughs> it's to be expected, I know. Um, but what's going on? I thought it was, you know, it was down to two something when I at least it was down for that when I went down south. So that was good. Um, shouts out to Amy for that ten dollar PayPal. Really appreciate you. Shouts out again to um those who people who super chatted during the stream. Uh, click that click that super chat button. Really appreciate you as always. Um. You can support me anytime. You can click uh, Cash App, PayPal, Venmo. You can sponsor a stream. You can give me ideas for streams. You can email me at madmaximalism 2 xs at gmail.com. Um, you can also support me by supporting our homies out there because that supports me because we're all part of this wonderful community. Um, shouts out to Kristen out there. For instance, you can go to Slow Boy Whiteboard and you can sub to her awesome channel. Shouts out to Kristen for that $5 cash app. Really appreciate you. You can, you can, I mean, everybody here is already with uh, Church of the Eternal Logos and with JD over at Jay's Analysis, Jamie Hanshaw over at her channel, uh, beautiful Tristan over at um, Problem Ledge Health, Jerry, our homeboy Jerry at Exposing Powerful Lies. He's going to have Chase on um, sometime soon. Who else? Um, you can support our homeboy Technoir Graphics on Instagram. Please go to Instagram and follow me on Instagram if you haven't. Um, and you can always reach out. So give me ideas. Give me more books. Uh, we've done 104, I think 104 streams now, and we're going to keep going. Shouts out especially uh, to Rachel Wilson, based homeschool mama, who's going to be doing her own channel soon. Hopefully I'll be on there. Um, maybe Jerry and I will be on there doing, um, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say what we're doing because it might be a surprise, but that's going to be fun. I think I've already said it, but I'm not going to say it again because it might be a surprise. And shouts out uh, especially to our homeboy, Andy BPF over there at the Crucible. Love you. Um, and that's about it, you guys. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you all. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Uh, got to keep on living, right? L-I-V-I-N. Uh, got to reach out to your family and friends. So just, you know, that's just, the th I it's not advice. Duh. It's just, I don't know. 
We love your family and friends. And I love y'all. Appreciate y'all for being here. Thank you to TZ. Thank you to Jethro. Um, thank you to my sister who was in here earlier. Shouts out to my sister. And shouts out to everybody out there. So really appreciate everybody. And uh, I will see y'all soon. So thanks, y'all. Peace.